Welcome back, Tribe. We're here today with special guest Pete Couts of Alliance Martial Arts, and we're going to be discussing 52 blocks and the expression of the African-American martial art that has been something of a mystery to a lot of us in the community. Hopefully we'll shed some light on what 52 is and what 52 isn't and look at some of the work that Pete is doing now with uh, Light Burley, one of the leading proponents of 52 blocks. So with uh, no further delay, Pete, how are you doing tonight? Hey, very, very good, man. How are you guys doing? Good, good, man. Glad to have you on the show. Pete, hey, for... For the audience at home, uh, so they can kind of get a little bit of understanding of who you are, and I've been following your, your work for quite some time, but for those that are, may not be as familiar with you, give us a little bit of uh, background on what type of work you're doing in the martial arts, what your background is, and you know what your specializations are as far as training and teaching. Nice. Okay, I've been in the martial arts uh, since I was in like about fourth, fifth grade, and uh, always involved with knife arts, weapon-based arts. There was the book Cold Steel, finding that in the public library, even before taking classes that really uh, drew me into all of this, and especially the warning at the beginning about, you know, the information in this book is, is very dangerous, and don't let it fall into the hands of children lest they kill someone by accident, which, you know what I mean, as a, a young kid who could read well, it was like, okay, uh, I have to read this book now. And, you know, from there I got into different uh, Kempo and different martial arts, uh, very much into our niece. That was where I got my first black belt, 1991, with Professor Remy Prasis. Um And we were very much into the, the knife, the sword and dagger. And, uh, you know, we were always making uh, training weapons to bring in them to camps because you remember back then you couldn't really find, like, knife trainers, right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. You, you just, you just had, like, rubber knife, and you had, like, the karate tanto. And so we would be making uh, that kind of training gear and working with it. And, um, you know, that kind of led me to uh, Mr. Keating and what he was doing. And uh, that pretty much set the standard for me then as far as, like, right, you know what I mean? I enjoyed the traditional arts. I, had, uh, I did kung fu, uh, praying mantis, different styles. But... I really enjoyed sort of more the, the eclectic brand and uh, blend and drawing from the different traditions, uh, including a lot of the Western traditions, which at that time, you know, in the 80s, really nobody was uh, talking about that too, too much. And so that was very hard going, researching that material, but then sort of with the dawn of the Internet, uh, sharing that kind of information became so much easier. And so then that was probably 15-year jag with with researching all different kinds of, of fencing and medieval German combat and uh, different methods from around the world and sort of looking for what was the universal principles behind them. And, uh, you know, as far as uh, that underlie everything, as opposed to, you know, we can get so caught up in, well, this style calls this this, and this guy's do it a little different, but what's the underlying mechanic? And... Um, Along the way, gosh, picked up instinctive shooting as well, um, the ability to throw and, you know, hit small targets out of the air, uh, aspirins, things like that, you know. That's a, a fascinating skill unto itself, a uh, true American martial art. And then probably one, around 2007 when Mr. Keating and I were working on the Modern Knives DVD series, on one of the DVDs, number two, he did a segment on the five elbow shields, and it was the elbow shields material. That's what kind of led me into the 52 blocks was because I was just looking around. Well, who else utilized this technique to a high degree? And then seeing light, I was like, well, geez, here's our, our shield one. There's skull and bones. Here's shield two. That's closed door. And so we, I started to, you know, see the connections uh, with that material. So I think, you know, to answer a, a short question in a lot of words, that would sort of take me from there to here. Excellent. Now, Pete, in 52 is, is, for those listeners at home who may not be familiar with it, and it's something that's, without exaggeration, it's been kind of part of the martial arts mythology for, for a while now. And I think it's safe to say only in the last you know, maybe 20 years, we really start to see things come out, you know, in print or or publicly. I think maybe even the last 10 is only the time we've seen people putting things to video. Really since YouTube. YouTube really was what broke the, broke the door open on that. Before yeah. that, 
You know, I mean, uh, I said the light at one point, you know, it was kind of like a ghost. Everybody's heard of ghosts, but, you know, how many people have really seen one? It's always somebody, you know, somebody says that my cousin saw one one time, and it was like this, and that was pretty much 52. It was a lot of I heard stories and, you know, very vague uh vague rumblings of it on the internet in different articles, but there wasn't a lot of solid information on on it or on anyone's approach to it. And, you know, in talking about all of this, let me sort of clarify, I'm coming from the perspective of 52 AOD, which is art of defense, and that's kind of Light Burley's flavor of the art, because this is what you would technically call in academic speak a vernacular martial art. And that means it's a martial art that was passed on from person to person in oral tradition. There is no one master. There is no one manual. There is no anything like that that we can go back to. If, if there was, I'd love to say it. I would love to say, well, in fact, Jack Johnson created the art of 52 blocks, and he put it down in his secret book. This was given to, you know, I mean, passed down to Eddie Futch, and, uh, but that that's not the case, okay? Uh, so many people have done something under some name, uh, and instead of 52 blocks is just one of the names that this was known by. Right, and Pete, I, I mean, I remember, I think, as far as I can recall, the only person ever to put anything in print early on was probably Dennis Newsom, and I, I interviewed him uh, right, where they called it Jailhouse Rock. Jailhouse Rock, exactly. And I remember interviewing Mr. Newsom. God, it's got to be about 20 years ago now. And right, it just cool. it just left more questions than answers, to be honest with you. Um, because we, you know, I think the only thing he'd actually ever put out maybe like a one or two articles that kind of showed. Sure, the there were some and, photographs in black belt, and yeah. you know, a few things that you could find on Stick Grappler's page, and uh, that was pretty much it. You know, sort of again until until the YouTube phenomenon came around, and then and then we could see we could see different people that were putting up something and saying, okay, that's what it is, and uh, you know, and we could look at it, and and you know, and finally say, okay, um, and that was how I found it was just, you know, like yourself, uh, there's tons of martial arts out there that I've always wanted to see, and with YouTube, you have the advantage; you can go on there and say, well. Gosh, what's Kaji Kambo look like? How about Warang Do? I'd like to see a little bit of Pukalan, Shaminde, Penchak Silat. You know, anything you can name, you know, you can find it on there. And so I was just going through different arts and thinking of names, and I'm like, hey, I'll just search this one. And, uh, you know, the first thing actually I found was a video by a fellow saying that 52 was fake. And I watched the clips he used as proof it was fake, and I said, well, gosh, that looks good to me. I, I can see what they're doing, and, you know, uh, one thing led to another, but I think that was really what, what broke it open to the general public so that people could see it and they could compare people's methods and, you know, their teaching methods, their students, and, you know, to draw their own conclusions. Right. Now, Pete, let, let's set one thing just to kind of set the tone of the interview, and I want to make this real clear to the audience, and I'm glad yeah. that you, you prefaced this as far as, you know, that you're going to be discussing, you know, Light Burley's expression of this art. Just like any other martial art, there's a million, you know, uh, issues with politics and camps. And I just want the audience to understand that anything we talk about here is going to come from your personal experience dealing with your instructor and his expression of the art. Oh, yeah. You know, and God bless everybody out there that's doing it on any level or, you know, representing it in their own way. And if they do it different, that's awesome. You know what I mean? It's not something where I think there there should or ever could be you know, one one set way. It's not that kind of art. Now, Pete, let me ask you, just to kind of start to unravel a little bit of this myth here, from your understanding of the history of, of 52, is this an art that is an African transplant, or is this just a fully, you know, homegrown, you know, uh, expression of of people in the United States? What's your take on it as far as the history of where this comes from? It's hard to say. I mean, it, it really is. Uh, what I can say that we can certainly, you know, we can certainly look at film footage of boxing going all the way back to the beginning of the century. And, you know, I mentioned Jack Johnson earlier. And we can go back and we can watch fights and we can see movements that are movements of the 52 in old films of boxing. And why, was, why didn't people see it? Because it happened so fast. You know, uh, overall, like in, in in a sense, you have to take yourself back to the mindset of uh, 
a boxer back in those days. Now, boxing was the first integrated sport before baseball or anything like this, okay? And so here you are. You're a fighter. You have to fight to make money, and probably you're not going to win a decision. So you have to develop a defensive approach to boxing. You can't get too beat up to win. And these guys, some of them were fighting in, I mean, what was called the Grand Malay, where they would put a number of color fighters in the ring blindfolded and have them just, you know, go to town. Uh, before the Royal Rumble used that term, the Grand Malay, that was the old meaning. Um, that was something you see on the what was called the Chitlin Circuit in the South. And so the fighters developed a defensive method of fighting. And they said, like, Jack Johnson was a master of picking off shots with his elbows and forearms. And that was something specifically you can read in accounts about him. And uh, so so this is, I, I see this as really uh, a big part of the origin of uh, a def- said this defensive approach to fighting, which is which is the core of 52. It's uh, it's a defense over an offense. You could put whatever kind of offense you want with it. Now let's talk a little bit about the 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 links to boxing. And I've heard some people express the opinion that 52 may only be you know a form of of dirty boxing to say. And others say, no, no, it's a, it's a totally different thing, and boxers would use it because, like you stated, they needed to get that advantage and needed to have the, the right game plan. And so it kind of trickled into boxing. What are your thoughts on it? Do you think it's, it's something you know, in and of itself, or, or is it just a form or an evolution of, of boxing from that time period? Well, I think in the modern day, you could say it's boxing plus martial arts. You know, it's sort of a mixture of the two. But inside of boxing, we can see different blocks that we use in the modern form, okay? Uh, For example, uh, the skull and bones, where you bring up the lead or the rear elbow to pick off a straight shot. Rob the bank, uh, which is also called like the cross-arm defense, or mm, the armadillo guard, okay? And so many boxers have used these these tricks and techniques over the years just as a way uh, instead of having having a different kind of advanced defense. Pete, tell me about how you personally got involved with 52. I mean, you started off watching this on YouTube, you know, reading yeah. an article here and there. How did it evolve to the point where you were training hands-on, you know, with one of the leading instructors in the, in the camp, of, you know, of, out there teaching 52 well it started i just like i said with anything else just watching it on youtube and then i just started making notes in my notebook collecting information what's the name of this block what's that movement how do you chain them together and i mean there wasn't that much information out there so you know i mean it's like anything else okay this is a new a new hunt a new uh trail to trace down and so it was just for my own interest at first and then one day after class, I just said to, you know, Kurt, who you see on a lot of my videos back in the day, I said, hey, man, would you stay after class and help me out with something? He goes, sure, what? I go, listen, just punch me out for, like, a couple rounds, and, like, I'm not going to hit you back. And so I just got out there and started to do it and actually train it, you know, and then it's like, wow, that was kind of neat. And so I just got into this pattern of doing that, and well, after a while, one night he says, like, well, what do you expect me to do because I can't hit you? And I go, well, you know, but just try your best. He goes, well, yeah, but you're doing something that you haven't shown me. And then, then it was kind of like, well, the cat's out of the bag now. Well, do you really want to know what this is? Well, yeah, yeah. And, you know, all the other students are nodding. Yeah, yeah, we want to see, we want to see. So I'm like, well, gulp. Okay, guys, there's this thing called 52 Blocks from New York. And, you know, um, that was it. And then by, like, 2012, 2013, you know, it was like well, that was pretty much what we were training here. And uh, so I sent, like, Burley uh, a videotape of us training, I mean, a DVD or whatever, but you know what I mean, like 30, 40 minutes of, of us just doing rounds and two-on-one fighting and wall boxing and different drills on the balance discs, double M bag, doing the blocks and, you know, counter punching on the focus mitts and, and what all, and that got his attention. And, uh, so then he came up in, what was it? 2014. That was the first time. And so we just hit it off like, you know, house of fire, good times and excellent training. And then he came back, um, 2015, we shot the first DVD up here, which was 52 blocks, basic training 
uh, because up to that point, he'd made a bunch of DVDs, but they were more documentary about the history and those different aspects of the arts and interviews, things like that. And so this was really something more for the martial arts people, like these are the drills you got to get doing. And uh, then he came back this year, and we did uh, 52 Blocks Footwork, and now we just finished up. I just finished up the editing the other day on another one, 52 Blocks Advanced Footwork, and um, I don't know if it's going to be on there or if it's going to be a bonus, but another DVD on uh, the razor, on uh, specific techniques of how the razor is uh, concealed in the mouth, how you spit it, and, and how it would you know how it would be used. Now, Pete, you've done a lot of martial arts training. You're you're a certified instructor in a lot of programs. You've seen you know a good sample of what's out there. And and qualified to teach a good sample of what's out there. Tell me from your personal experience what you enjoyed most about learning 52. What did you find most useful? You know, what were the things that you were able to um, maybe replace in your toolbox or use to complement your toolbox? How did it change you as a practitioner? Well, I think, you know, everybody in the martial arts were always learning different ways of attack, attack, attack. And it's, okay, well, what's the new, what's the new, okay, we can use a sword hand or we can use a tiger claw or a crane beak or hit with the elbow. Or, but defense doesn't quite get that same sexiness, you know. And what 52 really gave me was a, a much better defense, uh, you know, better footwork, uh, better mobility and the ability to just deal with uh, the pressure of the attack. And so uh, that is what I feel it really has to offer anybody. And then you can go into whatever your art is because, you know, you, even if you do a weapon on it, say even if you're at, you know, a pistolero or, you know, you're a knife guy or whatever it is, well, but probably you open hands when the fight starts, right? Yeah, yeah, it's how most people start out, exactly. So exactly. So here in that in that initial burst of of action, that you have a superior defense, you know what I mean, and then you can counter strike off that, get to a weapon, you know, push the guy away, or just you know what I mean, tie him up, whatever it is that you need to do. And so they said that's where I see that it can complement uh, people's what people do. Is that as far as as far as that kind of stand up fighting? Now, Pete, let me ask you, because. What I have seen of 52, it seems very different from what we might have as a traditional martial arts experience doing, you know, uh, Okinawan karate or, you know, taekwondo. It's a very different style of movement. How, you know, comfortable or how, you know, foreign did it feel to start working your body in that manner? Well, at the time, I was coming back off an injury, so walking pretty foreign to me. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it just helped improve my balance, and it helped improve my stability and my mobility um, tremendously. That was one of the reasons I went to it was because I said this is this is has great footwork. And so, I mean, I don't think it's foreign in any sense. I mean, it's different than it's different than karate, certainly. But I said it would just, you know, akin to training in boxing or Jeet Kune Do or, or anything like that. If you've trained in those kind of environments or, you know, those kind of, you know, maybe a little more uh, fluid kind of arts as far as footwork is concerned, I don't think that's going to be uh, a big transition for anybody. Now, Pete, I did see in some of the, you know, training materials that you've put out, you've done some work as far as uh, playing with some Wing Chun and 52. What? Oh, sure. You tell me about some of the the similarities to to the other arts that you've trained in. You know, what are some things that people may see and see as kind of familiar, maybe different flavor, but you know, kind of kind of see the root uh, of a kind of universal techniques. What what do we find in fifty two? Yeah, okay. Um, with the with the Wing Chun in fifty two videos, those were just kind of fun because oh, you know, YouTube people try to generate heat to put themselves over the top, so there was some some yap about that, and so. You know, some of it was just to show, like, oh, come on, everybody can get together and look, aren't these arts good and complementary to one another when practiced? And uh, others were to sort of show uh, differences in techniques where people had misunderstood. For example, the one uh, Quan Sao uh, versus Skull and Bones was just because, like, dozens of times I had seen people say, oh, Skull and Bones is just Quan Sao. And it's like, well, no, it's not. It's completely different. And so we'll just show you that. 
uh, other ones, let's say like um, like the ones with like me and Light Burley sticking hands or whatever. That's just that's just two guys playing around because we both have that skill base. You know, uh, he's like he's not a one-dimensional guy any more than I am. You know what I mean? He's got more tricks in his bag as far as as far as things like that go. Pete, now where do you see Fifty Two going? I mean, there's there's a few there's a handful of people out there, you know, publicly teaching it now. Uh, there's a couple of different camps, and I don't I don't know if you can speak for Light, but maybe you have some insight well, into. I mean, yeah, let's see, we're getting more instructors. Like I mean, I said, there's myself, Coach Dink, Coach Cool down south. There's, there's more guys in the funnel who it's more like you get them in here and make sure they got everything and send them back out. And then there's lots of people, so just lots of people out there doing it on their own and, you know what I mean, taking a piece of it and training it and working really hard on whatever level. So it's, it's very exciting, you know what I mean, when you see the amount of people on YouTube and Facebook that are into it. It's uh. It's exciting, you know, um, when the 52 Footwork DVD came out. The first copy that I mailed out went to a, a cat in Singapore. So, you know what I mean? So that really says to me, you know what I mean, it's an international uh, thing because everybody is interested, you know what I mean, in what somebody else has. You know, by the same token, like we sell a good number of Bowie Knife DVDs to people in Asian countries because, you know, they're interested. They're like, oh, yeah, sure, I'm from Taiwan and I have Kung Fu here, but I want to see about that big American knife. Now, with the instructor base kind of growing and more people getting out there and doing it, and like I said, I don't know if you can speak for Light, but maybe you can give some insight, you know, as somebody that's, you know, communicated a lot with him and for yourself from your own perspective. Yeah, what, I mean, and you can always get him on. I'm sure he would talk to you. Uh, that's got to be the next. <laughs> that's that's right, got to be the know? next call for sure. But uh, but what do you what do you see as some of the goals for the community? Is there is there a push to formalize this or just to let it be free and let people have fun with it? Uh, I don't think. I mean, I don't think you can contain it any more than running water. I mean, it's already out there. Like I said, it's a vernacular martial art. Everybody's a, a, approach is going to be slightly different. It should be slightly different. The fact is you could know two or three blocks and say, yeah, yeah, man, I know some 52. Uh, the at work, and a, a fellow who had, had been incarcerated for a while uh, was there, and, and, and when he heard about 52, right away he threw up his arms through some blocks. Now, he didn't know it, but he had seen it. So, I mean, there's so much of it out there in, in different places, you know what I mean? There's no, there's, there's no one standardized of anything. Uh, for ourselves, no, we're just keeping it on the good foot, training people, uh, you know, for health, for fitness. Uh, Life's been working with different people that are fighting in MMA and, you know, boxing, golden gloves. And I think that's a, you know, that's a very good direction. That's, uh, you know, elevating the art and, uh, you know, uh, using it for a good purpose. You know, bringing, bringing people together in the process. Pete, hey, tell me a little bit about 52 as far as, because it has a reputation, and part of the the, the the backstory of 52 is that, you know, depending on who you ask, it was, you know, a street art. It was a street fighter's art. It was something that was used in the hood. You know, a, a lot of what I heard for a very long time was, yeah, the reason why you can't find a 52 instructor is because these are the kind of people that aren't, you know, setting up schools. You know, they're, right. they're living a type of lifestyle where that's not really on their list of priorities. And I would imagine oh, that... Ab absolute, absolutely, you know what I mean? So that in the modern day that it is being shared, that is, it is unusual. Yeah, and my question is, because it has such a firm rooting in street culture and it was used primarily as a defensive art, I would imagine there has to be some weapons training there. And you did mention something about razor blades. Tell me about, you know, and I know you're a weapons guy, so tell me what have you found out as far as weaponry in 52? Now, see, again, this is one of those things. There might be people who their 52 has all kind of things. Maybe they have, you know, 52 knife disarms, or they've got, you know what I mean, 52 stick hits. But as far as I've learned it, it's a defense. Now, that defense can be used against weapons in the sense of your range awareness, the improvement of the footwork. You can use the different blocks different ways. Um, you know, and when we say block, you also have to understand that the block goes beyond just a physical interposing of the limb, like a, a, a fake could be a block, a correct use of footwork or timing, uh, something to disrupt the person's rhythm, okay? Anything that we do that's going to stop you from doing what you want to do, we blocked 
what you want to do in that sense. Now, that said, I've never seen any kind of knife techniques um, other than uh, the razor. And so, again, that's a, that's a specialized technique. And, again, just like how, we you know, when the Okinawans had, had their, they were disarmed, they had nothing. And so nowadays we've enshrined uh, a grain thresher and a handle of a millstone uh, as the, you know, the, the nunchaku and the tonfa, right? Uh, but these were these were just agricultural instruments, and so the same. This is, you know, what I mean. This is nothing to glorify. This is just, uh, you know, like a box cutter blade. But there is a way that it could be put into the mouth. It could be hidden. It could be spit out again. Uh, you know, a short distance into the hand in a way that it could be gripped and and used, um, which is terrible. You know what I mean? That's not. You know, I mean, it is what it is. And uh, so, but we've captured the information again for posterity's sake. We always, you know, on the videos, we always say for innovation, uh, information purposes only. But like on this one, I mean, you, you know, we really mean it. Obviously, that's a super dangerous thing to do to think like, hey, Jethro, what'd you do last night? Well, I put razor blades in my mouth, you know, tried to spit them out, but it didn't go so well. Uh, so, you know, it's a, just something to see, uh, you know, an odd aspect of the art. And then you can judge for yourself, like, did Tupac really spit a razor in above the rim? You know what I mean? Learn learn about how to do it, and then you could answer that question yourself. You know, do can people hide one under their tongue, or is that a myth? Well, we'll, we'll explain that. Can you spit one across the room, or is that a myth? Well, you know, so we'll answer those questions and more. Pete, hey, let me ask you this. The, what, like I mentioned before, I, I had interviewed some people about 52 many, many years ago, and yeah. a, a lot of what I heard back from was, you know, 52 is for African Americans, and we're not going to teach people that aren't African Americans. And it was very guarded. The people I interviewed, you know, had a very guarded uh, approach to their art. Light obviously does not. He obviously is out there to, to love everybody and share because he's, he's out there, he's putting out there, he's working with people uh, of all different backgrounds, and, and I commend him for that. But have you, just from a, a historical point of view, and maybe even just looking a little bit at the sociological issues going on with 52, do you know or can you speak to anything about the, the attitudes maybe from the past or maybe currently that other people may hold? As far yeah, as sharing, I, I, I had heard those things too. You know, obviously, like in approaching the art, you know, I'd heard all the same rumors that everyone else had about that. Oh no, no, no one's going to teach you. But uh, you know, uh, obviously, that's not the case. And uh, like I said, people, I, I don't think that has to do with the art. If someone has a, you know what I mean, a belief like that about about their culture or something, or who they're going to teach or not teach, that's up to them. I mean, there are there's many styles of, of martial art around the world. If you're not from a certain uh, sect or, you know, different group, uh, no, they won't teach you uh, certain Kung Fu or Silat, whereas, for example, if you're not a Muslim, they won't, they won't teach you that. Um, and then, you know, other ones where, oh, they've broken with that tradition in the modern day. And so, you know, Light's very open-minded. He's amazingly views people, you know, based on their hard work and dedication and, uh, you know, what they bring to the table. And that's what it should be about. Martial arts really, you know what I mean, are about bringing people together in the modern day more than they are about, you know what I mean, fighting and killing and, and all these other things. I mean, if you just think about this, like in the 40s, right, people in America were taught to hate the Japanese. Like there was cartoons like Bugs Bunny putting hand grenades in ice cream bots and, and giving them to Japanese soldiers, and then they blow up and just leave buck teeth and glasses in the air. You know what I mean? And that's like 1943. Uh, Bugs Bunny nips the nips, if you want to go look that one up. Uh, and then well, by the 50s, like Oriental culture was becoming a bigger thing. It's GIs are bringing it back. By the 60s, there's judo competition everywhere, and – you know, this new thing, karate, is coming on the scene. By the 70s, we have a new term even, American karate. We've already made it our own. By the 80s, there's schools all over the country. By the 90s, it's part of our regular fitness protocol as like Taibo and all the spinoffs. And so in less than 50 years, we've gone from, you know what I mean, people being taught to hate this one group to it's completely accepted and it's a normal thing and you're going to go do some karate right after soccer. And so, you know what I mean? The martial arts are, are a great force like that to bring everyone together. 
uh, you know what I mean? Because and I think for so many of us, we we've met so many people who are just come from different walk of life when we go to different camps or different trainings. You know what I mean? But what matters the most is what's their what's their discipline, what's their dedication to the art. Like what do they give back? Well, that's a great insight, Pete. It definitely is. Now, Pete, let's move on a little bit to the training materials that you're putting together. And for the audience out there that may not own a Pete Couch DVD, I want to say I, I've got a, a good number of them in my collection. And I really like the way you put your, your work together in general. If somebody's okay. out there looking for a demo video, that's not the place to go. Uh, I, it's been my experience with your materials, your training materials, that they're very digestible, they're very um, progressive, and it's something you can actually learn from. And, you know, you give people a, a good, you know, layout, and it's something you could follow and learn at home. So with this art that's been so incredibly inaccessible for such a long time, tell me, where do you even start to put together a, a DVD series? Well, we started with uh, the first one is Basic Training 1 was the first one that, that Light and I put together. And it, that one just covers what are fundamental things that, that a person needs to know. As far as we, you know, we figure probably already you've got jab, cross, hook, uppercut. You've got some sense of, you know, of different things like that. But as far as uh, the fighting strategy, as far as things like keeping the shoulder line, as far as the kickstand balance, as far as so many different specific aspects of uh, of the technical work, different training drills. How do you use the focus mitts? How do you do some of the different uh, blocks, the skull and bones? Closed door, triangle trade, uptown, you know, uh, just that all these just these different movements. So there's just there's a lot of material to put out there. Um, now one thing Light did to help with people learning was he made uh, sort of like a form you could say, uh, just as a way of practicing the blocks. And uh, you know that's something because people have said uh, when they hear the name 52 blocks they go well cool how many of them, how many of them do you know and I'm like what do you mean. Well, do you know all 52 yet? And uh, so just, just to clarify, there's not really 52 specific different ways of interposing the arms. You know what I mean? There's like 30-some. And uh, so you see those get repeated said throughout the form. And uh, so, so things like that uh, are the things that you're going to find on the, on the DVDs. Said, and from there, we went into uh, footwork was the next one, which, again, the footwork is such a, a key aspect. You know, uh, they say in boxing, the mission is to get into position to hit your opponent from the furthest distance away with maximum leverage without getting hit in return. And, like, that sounds pretty simple when you lay it out like that. But the first part of that mission statement is to get into position. And so if you can't do that, you know what I mean, all the, the power punching – or, or whatever else you have, it's you know, I mean, you can't get your you can't get your army where it needs to be. Now, do you have plans for for future DVDs with Light? Are you is this going to be an ongoing series, or? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, so the, we've already done advanced footwork, which then picks up where the footwork uh, leaves off. Uh, we did the razor footage, which we talked about, and yeah, so this is a pretty much this is an ongoing project. Every time he gets up here. We're trying to put out another volume of it, get another piece of this captured, and uh, so that, you know, the whole thing will be, you know, all the training drills, all the material will be preserved, you know what I mean, uh, into the future, and so that people can practice it in, in some kind of organized format. Uh, because this is stuff that, you know, he picked up from different places. He picked it up piecemeal. And it was his ability as a martial artist and his, his thinking as a martial artist is why it's in the, the format that it's in today or why he's even teaching it, right? Because like you said, most people just learned it, they used it for themselves, and there was never a thought really to pass it on in, in a big way. Like maybe you teach somebody, but, but to actually go out and teach this to the masses, no, no one had thought to do that. And so with this, you know, his method is it's that it's an encapsulation of the best that he had seen from different people. And, Pete, let me ask you this. Is the art something, and I know this is a very generalized question, that each individual is different, but in your experience with your students, is it something that people pick up relatively quickly? Is the learning curve high on yes. this? It, it is? No, no. It's, it, it, if, you do, if you do the correct training methods, you can learn this very, very, very quickly. 
um, especially now that the information is out, you know, uh, because like anything, it's like if there's only a little bit of information out there, you could train for 10 years and still not have the whole thing, right? But now that there's there's people out there that have the have the program and that are trying to put people through it, this is something, I mean, in a year, you could be really good. I mean, you'd be, you know, you could fight well. In, you know, in a couple years, you could have the whole thing down, you know, be in good condition because, you, you know, you're doing your conditioning and stuff on top of it, and that's that's a big part of it. I mean, so much of it, it's not, uh, you know, we're not levitating in the full lotus position or something. You know, you know, a lot of it is like, okay, put the fast feet on, which is a surgical tubing band with two straps to your ankles, and put that on in the weight vest and then get out there and you know okay and you're going to be spending rounds and rounds doing different footwork drills you know so they said there's nothing magical to it but if you'll go through that training yeah people can develop it very quickly and uh the focus mitts is is a big method too in teaching people uh the shoe shining and the different kind of focus mitt drills if you look at our youtube you can see a bunch of that and uh and a lot of a lot of times people learn those as a student but I make everybody learn them as the coach as well. And what I found was as soon as I forced everybody to learn them as the coach side, it was like their boxing went up 10% like within a couple of weeks because it made them, again, that much more precise and uh, that much more conscious to think ahead of the motion and be able to control the boxer well with them. So, it's, uh, so yeah, it's fun training. It's, uh, you know, if you, <laughs> if you like sweating and hitting things and you know what I mean, uh, boxing and calisthenics, it, it's, it's hella good fun. Uh, if you don't like getting hit, then probably it's not for you. <laughs> now, Pete, one aspect of, of training in general that, it, from my impression, that 52 really has a, an appreciation for and a method of, of conveying it is strategy and that kind of element of deception and strategy. Uh, tell me about it. What, what, what lessons did you learn or were you able to to see in your learning of 52. How important of a component is that to really understanding it and being able to functionalize, you know, your, your training? Well, if you don't have strategy, all you have is technique. And that's kind of like having a lot of tools and no knowledge of carpentry. <laughs> you see, because uh, you, you can practice, have punches and kicks, but not know when to apply them. And so it's important to have an art that has fighting theory okay now Wing Chun is a great example of an art with fighting theory there's the Q and Q it so you can go and read and understand these principles uh, you know uh, like the one everyone out there will will know the one you know uh, follow, stick with what comes follow at home in absence of contact punch in a straight line to have those kind of, of different theories uh, to guide you in the fight and so it's the, exactly the same here there's specific ways that you would stand and you would line up your shoulders, for example. And as long as you keep your shoulder in square with his shoulder, you've taken away one of his hands. And if he doesn't know that, he might be really chasing you with that hand and you don't have to pay any attention to it. So, I mean, do you think if you were sparring and you knew the guy could not hit you with one of his hands, that's a big advantage to you, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, uh, that's a dream. The foot position is another one, okay? Um, for example, a lot of people talk about the southpaw advantage, and as if this was something that only the southpaws had. But here's the fact. When you're fighting in a mixed lead where one of you is uh, with a left lead and one of you is with a right lead, so you're not both the same, either person can have the advantage as long as they understand the correct foot placement and the correct angling that they need off of that. And it's a really, really simple thing. It's a no-brainer once you know it, and you, you'll go on autopilot with it. And, uh, again, once, that one trick, you can hit a lot of guys with it. So uh, that's why they say, you know, the sweet science, it is a complete science. And when you know those kind of tricks and the other guy doesn't know it, well, hey, sweet for you. But I think that's, that, that is a huge thing, as well as the mental uh, calmness or the mental clarity to go and do the stuff. And that comes through the defensive drilling. Because there's a point, as you know, um, if I said, like, what we're going to do with this drill is, okay, really put your gloves on. Now, for two minutes, I just want you to defend yourself, and the other guy's going to hit you however he wants. And now, and then after two minutes, reverse rolls. Like, people are going to be really scared and flailing and... You know what I mean? But when you can learn to just relax and just roll with that and just that's a normal day for you, 
um, they said that's going to put you uh, ahead because you said your your mind isn't full of uh, so sort of that fear reactivity, being slowed down, being distracted by all that. Great. Well, Pete, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to, to come and talk with us today. Definitely excited to know that you're putting all this knowledge to video with light. And I want to recommend that everybody go check out Alliance Martial Arts. Pete, if people are interested in coming to classes locally with you, if they want to bring you out for workshops or seminars on any of the many martial arts that you teach, or just get a hold of some good training products, where can they reach out to you? Exactly, AllianceMartialArts.com. That's the easiest place to find me. Um, you can find me on Facebook as well, but I'm, I, I don't really hang out there too, too much, you know, just to talk to a few people, check in on places like the Raven Tribe. Uh, but the website is always the easiest place to contact me. Excellent. Well, Pete, thank you again very much. It was a pleasure having you on, and hopefully thank we can get you. Thank you so much. You. I really enjoyed it. I hope it was of, of some value uh, hearing me babble about these topics. I hope I answered your questions as well as I could. Um, you know, if anything else comes up or if you want to talk about the buoy or something in the future, hey, give me a shout. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully we'll get you on to talk about that real soon. I really All appreciate right, it, Pete. Thank you.